things I need to go over with you. One, thank you for loving on this family who is staying with us, whose little boy had heart surgery this week. He's progressing. Um, been a lot of sickness there um, because of medication. A lot of fluid has built back up around the heart and in the lungs. He's doing better. Um, thank you for the, the food. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the letters and all. Um, it, man, you have, you have made your pastor so proud by the way you've cared for this family. So thank you for doing that. Uh, the second thing is let me give you a quick analogy. When we moved here, we bought a house that was built in 1985, 87, something like that. And uh, we gutted the place and redid it, had a full basement. And, uh, you know, D.B. said, should we do this now? I said, Look, if you don't do it now, you'll never do it. So we, ref we did the basement. Uh, it was unfinished. So closed it in. Great place to go. It's a great place when, all the, when you've got 16 grandkids and they come to the house, go to the basement. You know, get, go down there. And uh, Debbie's fixed it up so nicely. And uh, occasionally we get down. We don't live in the basement. We live in the upper floor. Um, that's where you have to live in the church. Uh, things in the basement are great. Things are, they're good down there. Personalities are in the basement. Uh, programs are basement type things. People are basement type things. Um, place is a basement type thing. The past, all of those are good things, but I don't live, I don't live my Christian life based on some preacher's personality. Um, that's why I tell you, don't, don't put your faith and trust in me. Look to Jesus. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't keep your eyes on Mac Brunson. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Take personality out of, get in the upper room where you've got a view where you've got a vision. Our vision for the church at Old Town is that we're going to have a church there that's preaching the gospel. Take the personality out, okay? Take the programs out. Those things come and go. Uh, take place out. Places change. Sometimes churches move a mile down the road. But if it's all about the place, well, mama was buried there. Well, listen, if she could get up, she'd move too, probably. <laughs> you know, that, so keep those in the proper perspective. We're planning a church. You know, well, when is this going to happen? What's that going to do? What, what's this going to be? We're planning a church. That's the mission, reaching people for Jesus Christ. That's the vision. Get out of the basement. Come to the upper room, look out the windows, because it looks great up there, okay? Now, that's what I'm going to share with them this morning, and then I'm going off on a totally different text, because God's given me a, a word, I believe, to share with them this morning. Now, I want you to take your copy of God's word, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, which leads into verse 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. All of this points back to what? Peter has said in verse 17. And what you come to in verse 17 uh, and 18 and 19 and 20, you come to what possibly is one of the three most difficult passages in the New Testament to deal with. They're not only hard theologically, what in the world is going on here, but it is very difficult structurally. That is, if you try to diagram the Greek in this, it is, it is almost a not impossibility. Um, it's, it's as if Peter is talking about um, this one thing, and he gets off on this subject, and then he gets off on yet another subject. Then he jumps back to this, and then he jumps back over here to this. And you've got to try to keep what's going on. What is he saying? What's the main thing that Peter is saying in this passage? Now, if you're there, 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 17. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer. You say, well, hey, oh, my Lord, have mercy. Wait a minute. You mean God wills that we suffer? Um, what if that's better for you? You say, well, suffering is never better for me. Don't you think God knows better than you do about this? What if you suffer? 
Uh, it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right. Now, l- let me just tell you, this is why you should bring a Bible with you. You need this. You need to see this. This reinforces, you catch it. If you can read it and hear it as I preach through it, it's going to stick a lot better. So look at what he says again now. Just look at this. It is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right. Well, if I got to suffer, I'd sure lot rather suffer for doing what is right than doing what is wrong, wouldn't you? And in life, you're going to suffer, you know, regardless of, uh, of what you're told on television or in, by some televangelist, you're going to go through periods of suffering. He says, what if God has will that you go through suffering? It's better that you suffer for what is right. Now, he's speaking to Christians who are going through suffering. Do y'all remember this? It was February the 15th, 2015, when these 21 Christian Arabs were lined up on the beach in Libya, their backs to the Mediterranean, right there, and ISIS gave them the opportunity to reject Jesus Christ, to embrace Allah, and 21 men said, nope, cut our heads off, we won't do it. Now, that's suffering right there. That's shocking to us. That's what these people were going through. And so he comes and he says, listen, you're going to go through periods of suffering. Be sure that you're suffering for what is right. And if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, there are going to be seasons and periods and times of suffering. Different levels of it, but you can be sure you're going to suffer through it. Now, this is what he's going to do. He's going to give you an example of Christ in this because he's done this all through this little book. You go back to chapter 1, just look at what he said when he comes and he calls you to be holy. Chapter 1, verse 15, he says, be holy yourselves in all your behavior like the Holy One who called you. Everything that he gives us a directive, an imperative that he calls us to do, he says, listen, let me, let me take you back uh, to Jesus Christ and point Jesus Christ out to you. You be holy like he's holy. Chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 21, you've been called for this, for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered, you, you're called to suffer for the things of God, to suffer for the things of Christ. And since you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, you behave like Jesus in these times. Now, chapter 3, last week we went through this whole thing of trouble. You're going to face trouble. You're going to face trouble days. There's going to be trouble times. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? You remember what I said about that? Who is it? Uh, The whole world. That's who's there to oppose me and to fight me, not just the seen world, but the unseen world as well. I'm going to go through trouble. So he comes and he says, listen, here's an example. When you're suffering for what is right, you need to remember Christ has victory over evil ultimately. Now there's the sermon right there. Christ has victory over evil. Now that's where he's going to pick up in verse 18. And because of time, because I'm going to give the invitation. Now I've got to go and preach elsewhere this morning. Uh, follow with me and let me move you through this. Let me show you he's talking about Christ's victory over suffering. Is there victory over suffering? Yes. How do you know that? Because Christ had victory over suffering, or over sin. He has victory over sin. Can I have victory over my sin? Yes, you can. How do you know that? Because Christ gives us victory over our sin. Verse 18 is one of the great verses in the New Testament to memorize in order to share with people in a personal witnessing situation. For Christ also died for sins. Um, the just for the unjust, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. It's a great verse. And let me just walk you through this as you look at it. For Christ also died for sins. Now notice that. It doesn't say that he died because of his sins, because he had no sin. It's very clear. He died for our sins. That's how Peter starts this off. Jesus suffered for me. 
Jesus suffered for you. He is suffering for our sins, not his sins. And do you see that little word right there, for Christ also died? And then at the end of the verse, you see he was put to death. Two different words, dead and death. Thanatos is death. But the word for, for Christ also died, the word there in the Greek for died means the agony of being put to death, uh, the, um, the suffering of dying. It describes the process and not the event. So there he's saying Christ was suffering. Christ was going through this grievous suffering. Christ was going through this uh, pain, this anguish of dying. And he died, look at this. It was sufficient once for all. Now on 10,000 altars and 10,000 cathedrals in 10,000 places this morning, mass is being held and Christ is being put to death again. Let me tell you, 10,000 times, no, he died once, once. Do you know why? Because that's all it took. It was that sufficient. It was so sufficient that if every man and woman living right now repented of their sin and trusted in Jesus Christ, it is so sufficient that every sin would be buried under the blood of Christ. Every person would be forgiven for all of eternity and there would be more enough of that forgiveness for 10,000 more worlds out there. Yes. Sufficient. Once for all, Christ died for sins. Not every time the church gets together, once. But look at this as well. It was substitutionary. The just for the unjust. That is, Christ died in my place. He's the just, I'm the unjust. He died in your place and in your place and in your place for you and for me because, listen, we were up to our eyeballs in sin and guilt. No man can pay for his own sins. So Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, stepped in and became my substitute. He died on the cross. If they had crucified me on the cross, I would die in my sin. Because even being crucified for my sins, I couldn't pay for my sins. He paid for our sins. He was the substitute. And number three, it was successful. Did you notice this? that he might bring us to God. Look at that verse. For Christ also died for sins, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Now, when you say that he might bring us, it, it in English could imply a little bit of doubt there. He might bring us to God. If you read it in the Greek, let me tell you, it is a purpose clause with a henna. Henna is a little word in the Greek that when you're reading it and you come to it, I almost always translate it in order that. It's one of those little particles. It's a connector. In order that. He died once for all, the the just for the unjust, in order that. He would bring us to God. Purpose claw for the purpose of bringing us to God. There is no doubt whatsoever that the price that Jesus paid on the cross at Calvary, when you receive his work at Calvary, you are forgiven of your sins. There is the announcement of the victory of Christ over sin in your life. Now listen to these two verses. I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to listen to what is said there. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's the word that I'm giving you this morning. You've been reconciled to God because of Jesus Christ. He doesn't hold your sin against you anymore. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Listen to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 and listen to what is said there. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was my substitute on the cross. And when he died, he took my sin away. That is the victory over sin. Now, let me give you the second thing, and the second thing is this, victory over suffering. Pick it up in the middle of verse 18. In the middle of verse 18, Peter continues to write, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That is, they crucified him physically. He died There was no swooning. There was no passing out. They didn't put him in that tomb thinking that he was dead and he resuscitated later. He was actually dead. That's what the passage says right here. Having been put to death in the flesh, but in his spirit, his spirit was still alive. Now, at some point, all of us are going to die. I'm going to drop dead. And the very moment that I drop dead, this physical body is dead, but Mac Brunson lives on. You have a soul. You have an eternal soul. That's the spirit of God uh, that God breathed into you, and you became a living soul. You will live for eternity somewhere. Uh, Your soul is who you are. It's the eternal you. This body is temporary. Thank the Lord. But your soul is eternal. Christ, when he was crucified... Physically, he was dead, but his spirit was alive. Now, that's why you read this small s. Now, that's why, again, you need a copy of God's word. Do you see that there? That he was made alive in the spirit, small s. It differentiates between the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Christ that lived on when the body was put to death. Now, what did that spirit do? Look at verse 19, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Okay, this is going to begin to get tough now. What in the world is Peter talking about here? In which also refers back to that little s spirit, the spirit of Christ that was alive when his body was put to death. That spirit in which he also, that spirit, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now, let me tell you something. There are more interpretations of this passage than I can stand up here and give to you. And in fact, let me tell you, preaching is not standing here and throwing out this person's interpretation and that person's interpretation, somebody else's interpretation. I have to come to the place where I grasp for myself as as pastor what's being said in the text and then come and preach it to you. So I'm not this is not a seminary class on how to you know first Peter and how do you interpret this passage and what are all the variants because there are so many. Some of them will tell you that Jesus Christ went and preached the gospel to people who died in the Old Testament so they could hear the gospel and that they would be saved. That's not what it says. Now, if that's been your belief all this time, just hang with me and let me walk you through this. Do you see the word proclaim right there? It is not the word euangelizo, which is the gospel. Euangelos, good news. Euangelizo, to preach good news. That's not the word. He did not preach good news to whoever he was speaking to. We'll get to that in a moment. So it was not Jesus Christ going and preaching the gospel to people who had died in the Old Testament that needed to be saved. By the way, all of those who put their faith and trust in Jehovah in the Old Testament are saved. They look toward the cross. That's a whole nother sermon. Y'all are looking at me crazy this morning. Are y'all okay? Okay. Now listen, listen. Well, what did he do? The word there is caruso. That's a word that is often used with Christ whenever he spoke. He would, you've heard of Caruso, the great singer, Caruso. It means to herald. It means to announce. He went and heralded something. You, you herald an announcement from a king. 
So he went and he heralded something. He went and he announced something. He didn't go and preach something. He heralded, he heralded an announcement. What did he herald? I win. That's what he heralded. That's what he announced. Well, who did he announce that to? Spirits in prison. He said, well, now, my Lord have mercy. Who are these people? Well, let me just take you down to verse 22 and look at how verse 22 ends up because it's a reference back to these spirits. Who is at the right hand of God? That's Jesus now. We'll come to that in a moment. Having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. You, you're going to read that a number of times in scripture. If you get back to Ephesians chapter 1, do you remember where it says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him in heavenly places at his right hand in, in, in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Th those are ranks of demonic powers. There are demonic powers that are called powers, some that are called authorities, some that are called um, just angels. They're fallen angels. They're malevolent angels. They're angels that left and followed after Satan uh, when he rebelled against God. So if I go back up now to verse 19, I begin to put together what is said in verse 22 with verse 19. Now that's who is in prison. By the way, tataro is the word there for prison. Comes out of Greek mythology. The Jews... And the rabbis of Judaism had picked up this word from out of Greek mythology that spoke of one of the lowest um, caverns of, of hell. And uh, that's the word that is used here. It's kind of interesting. I just threw, look, that didn't cost you one thing for me to tell you that. So I just threw it in there. It's interesting. They're in a specific place. Go with me over to Jude. It's almost, it's right before the book of Revelation, just a few pages over. Jude, chapter 3. Some of y'all looking for it, aren't you? There's only one chapter in Jude. Verse 6. And angels, now, Jude writes, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Now, what is he talking about there? They did not stay in this angelic form. These angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their... We, we've got a word that we use now. They morphed into something else. He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So there are some angels you get... Very quickly, this idea that these are malevolent angels, these are fallen angels who changed their appearance. They morphed into something else. Now, is there anywhere in Scripture that we read about that? Genesis chapter 6, the days of Noah. Now, I'm going to read you a passage here. It's another difficult passage to deal with, but listen, because I think all of this fits together. It came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, now who are the sons of God? Well, when you read that in the book of Job, we understand that to be angels. Now it can be either benevolent, good angels or malevolent, evil angels. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men, now who is that? Well, that's the daughters of men. Females, human females, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves. Now, I've got to stop right here, and I've got to go back to that passage where Jesus says that angels neither marry nor are, are given in marriage uh, but, and that's the way we will be in heaven. And he makes that reference to angels, which gives you the implication that there is no uh, physical relationships that angels have. So they morphed out of that angelic body into the body of what looked like a human. 
And they took for themselves wives, whomever they chose. And the Lord said, no, this, I'm just not going to put up with all this. My spirit will not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. He says, nobody's going to live like they've lived prior to now. I'm, I'm tamping down on the length of life. But the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old renown, uh, men of renown. Now, you say, preacher, this is the bizarrest thing I've ever heard in my life. What's going on? What has gone on since the beginning when Satan rebelled against God and God comes to Eve and says, the seed of woman, that's virgin birth, by the way, the seed of woman is going to come and he is going to crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. He pronounced the, the defeat of Satan in Genesis chapter 3. And at that moment, Satan began a process of saying, I will prevent that child from ever coming. And so he does what? What's the first thing that he does? He tempts Cain to go kill Abel thinking that if he kills Abel, that will shut down any way that that male child will come through Abel. And being a murderer, God will never allow it to come through that line. And Satan begins to do this all through Scripture. He does it here. So what does he do? Man continues to increase and multiply. So he says, let's go in and let's just absolutely destroy the human race with a breed of something that is half demon and half human. You ever met one of those? They're still around. There are a couple of them that walk. <laughs> uh, that, uh, you'll, you'll meet them in Baptist churches from time to time. Ha half demon, half man. And so God says, nope, I'm putting all of that to death. And so he brings this flood and he puts all of that to death and he starts over with Noah and Noah's family. And then again, what does Satan do? He comes and he inspires man and says, hey, we'll become like God at the Tower of Babel. And God has to do something with that. And all the way, you watch this as you go through history, you come to the book of Esther, Haman says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put to death all of the Jews. We're going to have a holocaust and I'll kill all of the Jews, which does not work. You get into Israel, and there is David that sits on the throne, and God specifically says, now, through you, David, it is going to be a descendant of David. So what does Satan do at that point? He turns, and he begins to try to wipe out the lineage of David. You come down to the queen mother, Athaliah, who watches her son, who is king of, Ju of Judah, put to death. And then she goes and says, I'm going to take the throne. She kills all of her grandchildren except for one that is captured and taken away and hidden, Joash, who will eventually... This whole thing hangs precariously by a thread. <laughs> but it's God's thread. Amen. And Satan constantly is trying until there in Bethlehem, a baby is born and he incites the demonic Herod Go down and kill all of the male children. Three years of age and younger down in Bethlehem. And God has already told Joseph, get Mary and the baby. Get down into Egypt. Do you see this? Until all the way through his ministry, when he's baptized, the Holy Spirit comes on him. He is, he is empowered to carry out that ministry now he drives he is driven into the wilderness and for 40 days satan comes and tries to convince do it my way do it my way i'll give this stuff to you now i don't know where you're headed because satan doesn't know everything he says i'll give it to you now and jesus finally looks at him and says be gone I love his stuff. Man, if I wasn't preaching, I'd be running around out there somewhere. <laughs> to that night in the garden when there is this unbelievable pressure put on Christ. Father, can we do this any other way? Let, let's do it some other way. Can you let this cup pass from me? And then he says, but not my will, 
my will is still submitted to yours. And he goes to Calvary. And there on Calvary, he's crucified. And he dies. And all hell erupts in celebration until a streak of life appears in the darkest corner of hell where Jesus shows up and says, hey, I won. I won. And you just wait. I'm about to walk out of that grave. And nobody will even need to move that stone. I'll just go through it. That's what is happening here. That's what you see. It is the announcement of everything this could be. It is the announcement that Christ makes. I've not only conquered sin, I have conquered suffering. What does that mean for you when we suffer? What does it mean for these that Peter is writing to? It means ultimately our suffering will end in victory. But now look at this third thing. And the third thing here is this victory supreme. I, I've got to jump down. In the next service, we're going to have a baptism in here. And uh, I'd love to go through this whole thing on the baptism and, and Noah. But it is just a picture of God delivering us out of judgment. And you get to verse 22. Now, where is Christ? Christ, verse 18, is on the cross. Cross. Verse 19 and 20, listen, where is he? He is going to make the announcement, hey, just hang on, guys. You're stuck in this place for eternity. I've won. I'm about to walk out of this tomb. But now in verse 22, where is Jesus now? He's at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He is there. Who is at the right hand of God? Having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers, he went down there to just say, in my office I've got at home, in, in the library at home, I've got a, I might as well quit. Uh, I've got a, uh, an olive wood carving that I'd looked at for a year or two in Israel. Um, good friends of mine there, Swecky, that has a store down there. And he sells all of these great olive wood carvings. And uh, I, I was in there and I looked at this thing and I liked it. It's, a, it's, it's Michael with a sword. And he has his foot on the throat of Satan. Satan's head is sticking out this way. His body's back out this way. And um, I told Swecky, I said, Swecky, um, how much is that? Take it, take it. I spit on it. I don't want it. You take it. It's yours. And I said, no, just calm down. These Palestinians, they get, I just calm down. Just tell me what you want for it. He said, well, it's about $500. I said, no, it's wicked. I'm not paying that. Take it, take it. It's yours. I don't want it. I, I refuse it. Take it out of here. I said, I'm going to pay you something, but let's be reasonable about it. Well, you tell me the price. I said, you tell me the price. Well, he comes down to about a hundred bucks. And so I give him a hundred bucks for it. But that's the picture. And there are times when I just need to look up and look over at that thing, and I see old Michael with his foot on the throat of Satan, and I think, that's what God's promised me one day over my sin. He's promised me that all of that will be placed. It's under his foot now. But one day, thank God, I'll have victory over sin. You'll have victory over sin. Now, if I can sum this up, today's D-Day which is very meaningful to me because my dad went in on the invasion at Utah on D-Day. So I got to tell you, I got to tell you, and just listen, as Christ goes in to announce victory, March the 11th, that night, 1942, Douglas MacArthur was made by President Roosevelt to leave the Philippines. He didn't want to. Had said he was not going to leave his troops. Roosevelt said, you are the allied commander of the Pacific forces. I cannot leave you to the Japanese. You've got to get out. So from Corregidor, he took a PT boat, four of them really. Got him, his wife, his, his little girl, and all of his, his aides out. They got past the Imperial Navy blockade of the Japanese put him on Mindendale and a landing field on Mindendale, a, a B-17, picked him up and flew him into Australia. But he left General Wainwright 
He left Wainwright there, and he said, don't, whatever you do, don't surrender. Wainwright fought, great general, Jonathan Wainwright. He fought as hard as he could, but it was hopeless. They were overwhelmed by the Japanese, and he surrendered. They took Wainwright, now uh, a high-ranking American general, and they put him in a prisoner of war camp, gave him a little office, uh, but were brutal to him. They tortured him. They uh, nearly starved him to death. When they got to Wainwright, he was skin and bones. He looked like a walking skeleton. Uh, they did everything they could to humiliate him and embarrass him. Uh, they did everything they could that would just be dehumanizing to him. But when the Japanese surrendered, they got an American colonel and they said, you drive in to that POW camp and you find General Wainwright and tell him he is once again in control of all the forces in the Philippines that the Japanese have surrendered. That American colonel did just that. He drove past, Japanese posted there because they had heard. He drives into that POW camp, walks in, salutes General Wainwright and says, the Japanese have surrendered. You now are in charge of the entirety of the Philippines. It is in your command. The two guards stationed outside the door of General Wainwright's office began to humiliate him again and to mock him and to belittle him until Wainwright turns around and says, I'm the commander now, and you will follow my orders. And they said the two Japanese soldiers snapped to attention and saluted him. That's what Jesus did. He marched right into the pits of hell and announced his victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. That's our Jesus. Let's stand. All of us standing, our heads bowed. Barry's going to come, and he's going to stand right here for a time of invitation. Boy, you don't know victory until you know victory in Jesus. Man, what a hymn. Victory in Jesus. If you've never trusted him as your Lord and Savior, what a morning. No better time than this to come and say, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. No better time than this moment to come and say, I'm going to put my life into the eternal hands of Jesus Christ and trust that he will forgive my sins. Or to come and join this church. God's doing so many things in this church, church, that it's about to wear me out. So many good things that are happening. So many blessings that are going on. If you're looking for a church where Christ is lifted up and the word of God is preached and people love each other genuinely from the heart, you've come to it right here at Valleydale. Barry's going to come. He's going to lead us in a prayer. You come as God speaks.